Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Lead us from the unreal to the real Lead us from darkness unto light Lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Good morning, namaste everybody. So I had went away for a short trip, quick trip to India. Um, But now we are back for this session, uh, our usual Ask Swami session. What we do here is we have so many questions coming in from all over the world. And so we take a selection of those questions. Um, And also the audience here, you can ask questions too. Not any question. I'm not Encyclopedia Britannica. (laughs) (laughs) Questions related to spiritual life, especially to Vedanta, the path of self-knowledge, devotion, meditation, work. Um, the way it works is Diane, who's here, who's going to ask us some of the questions from the internet audience. And then you raise your hand, I'll call upon you, you come up here and you ask your question. Now these questions, whether what Diane is going to read out or what you're going to ask, don't keep waiting. I keep telling people, don't keep waiting for your question to come up, you know, and not listening to anything. When is my question coming up? It might never come up. But, but often what happens is, somebody else's question or the answer resonates with us. So it's always good to listen carefully. Uh, Try to grasp what the person is asking, try to grasp the answer and see if it makes sense. All right, let's go. Can you hear? Hello? Yes. Uh, The the first question is from Abhilash Srikumar from Lyon in France. Swamiji, my question is on Maya's ontological status. Compared to Atman, mind is only apparently real, a result of superimposition. It is then the product and not the locus of ignorance. Further, ignorance can't exist in the self because they're polar opposites. Mixing them is again due to ad yasa. I feel there is infinite regress or circular reasoning here. Should we view avidya and maya as a second independent entity coexisting with Brahman? Okay, that's a difficult one. It's one of those uh, (laughs) subtle philosophical questions, metaphysical questions. Uh, What he wants to ask, it's a well-known conundrum in the philosophy of Advaita Vedanta. It's called the locus of ignorance. The locus of ignorance or the locus of maya. Maya, Ajnana Adhishthana, Ravidya Adhishthana, in Sanskrit it will be called. What it means is simply this. In uh, Advaita Vedanta we assert that we are, you are Brahman itself, limitless existence, consciousness, bliss. And the reason, and all the problem is because we do not know this. Once we realize this, then from our perspective, from the perspective of Brahman, from existence, consciousness, bliss, there's really no problem at all. Um, but then this all is predicated on, it hinges on uh, one thing, this so-called ignorance of our real self. Now a question is asked, and we also come to this question, if you think about it a little bit, after some time you'll get this question. Alright, so ignorance is the problem. Call it maya, call it, there are other Sanskrit terms, ajnana, which means ignorance, avidya, which means the opposite of knowledge, which is ignorance, and so on. A question might come, where or whose is this ignorance? If all that exists really, really is Brahman, and then where is this ignorance? The ignorance can't be in Brahman. If Brahman is, compare it to the sun, there can't be darkness in the sun. Um, The answer would be, no, 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 ignorance is in us. 
in us sentient beings. We don't know our real nature, so ignorance is in us. Like all ignorance, I don't know maybe uh, German or I don't know Sanskrit and my ignorance of Sanskrit, ignorance of German is in me. But then that doesn't make sense either. I, the sentient being, I come after ignorance. You see, it's only because I do not know myself as Brahman, that's why I am as this um, being, you know, as this limited being. After all, you are asserting that I am Brahman, I don't know myself. That's why I, I, I am in this condition as a limited sentient being going through birth and death and suffering and all of that. Therefore, ignorance must have come before me. Let me catch this. Then only the question will make sense. The ignorance, I'm still talking about the question. We're taking, uh, making sense of the question. Ignorance has to come before I become a sentient being. I'm Brahman. Everything is fine. And then somehow maybe the ignorance has come and then I, I have somehow lost track of my real nature and I think, just like a dream for example. So you fall asleep and then you are a person in the dream, going through nightmare, suffering and all of that. But for that to happen there must be a waker who has fallen asleep. So the sleep must come before the person in the dream. The dream arises only after sleep has come. You can't say that the person in the dream is sleeping. I mean, the, in the character in the dream. Character in the dream exists only because the, the waker has fallen asleep. So ignorance cannot exist in me. I am a product, I the individual being, I'm a product of the ignorance. How can ignorance exist in me? It's circular reasoning as he says. So the question is, where does ignorance exist? Because, because uh, it can't exist in Brahman. The ultimate reality, it's supposed to be free of all problems. How can it have ignorance? And... Uh, it cannot exist in this individual being, sentient beings like us. We have ignorance about things in the world. We have lots of ignorance. But this primal ignorance about our real nature as Brahman cannot essentially be in me. It's prior to me. Surely it is in me, but it must be prior to me. Surely I do not know I am Brahman. I am unenlightened. I freely admit it. But this lack of enlightenment, this covering, this veiling, this maya must be there before I become this miserable creature. So, otherwise, it's, it, as he says, it's like circular reasoning. Uh, chicken or egg problem, which came first? Uh, seed or the plant problem, which came first? So, what's the answer? Um, the uh, alternative he suggested is, shall we then accept that there is Brahman and there is a power called ignorance separately existing? No, that won't work either. That will lead to... Um, dualism, which is anathema to the non-dualist, that are two separate existences, two things. And then the whole of non-duality will fall apart. By knowledge you get enlightenment. But if there is a separate power which veils Brahman, then knowledge of Brahman won't help you. The veiling will still work. Um, okay. So, what's the answer? Where is ignorance? Uh, two answers here. I'll give you the real answer and then the more uh, commonly accepted answers in Vedanta philosophy, Advaita Vedanta. The real answer to which we, we owe to Sureshwara, one of the great disciples of Shankaracharya, he said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Why? Because the question itself is, is uh, not a correct question. Where is ignorance? The answer is, it isn't. There is no such thing, no such reality called ignorance. But we are in ignorance, we are seeing the eff effects of it. No, whatever is dispelled by knowledge, never existed in the first place. Whatever you find by knowledge was already there. I have lost my, some people say I've lost my glasses, and the glasses are right on the bridge of your nose. I've lost my glasses and looking all over the, and, and so what you have lost by ignorance, you don't know it's right there. Yeah. You really haven't lost it. It's there. Yeah. And what you find by knowledge, you don't have to do anything. I suddenly I realize it's there and it's low and behold it's there. That was never lost in the first place. So ignorance is, I'm making a philosophical point here. Ignorance is not a reality. It's not what philosophers would call, doesn't have a, an ultimate ontological status. That's a fancy way of saying it's not ultimately real. You can take it as practically real because that's what we are trying to overcome in this world. Mm. But 
ultimately when you are enlightened you will see that there never was something like ignorance so this is the actual answer it's not a question that we should be bothered with proof of this uh, this also is look at the enlightened ones whomever you call enlightened in the non dual tradition whoever none of them ever looked back upon their state in ignorance and said hmm i wonder where that came from i mean i am enlightened now i am brahman i'm i'm free I'm, it's all done it's worked but that thing which was there where did that come from that's one mystery that still remains i have to give an answer where was ignorance no it's not a question for them at all it's not a real question it comes up because the mind wants to know okay what's the um, traditional answer which is given which is accepted if you go to a classical advaita vedanta pandit he'll give you one of two answers the two possibilities ignorance is in brahman and ignorance is um in the um, individual being first ignorance is an individual being who says this uh, this is said by one sub school of advaita vedanta called the bhamati tradition a great master called vachaspati mishra about 1000 years ago uh, he wrote this major commentary on shankara's commentary on the brahma sutras called the bhamati and which propounded this theory that ignorance is in us but doesn't that lead to circular reasoning he says no um because uh, the ignorance which is because of which we are here today it's it's something that that was there in the past life and that led to this present life and this present e- ignorant existence and when you get enlightenment when you get knowledge that ignorance is destroyed it's dispelled and you realize you are brahman where did that ignorance come from the past life it's not circular but it's not circular like he asks so it's a very well thought out question if it's not circular reasoning it's infinite regress because the question will be in the past life where did that ignorance come from which was there earlier for because of which we are here now we didn't know who we were in the, our past life and we went on doing stuff and generated karma and as a result of which we have been born in this life so that ignorant existence unenlightened existence in the past life is the cause of this present life that is very standard karma theory but where did then you'll ask the question where did that ignorance come from and the answer is came from the life before that <laughs> but where did the first ignorance come from and the answer they will be it didn't <laughs> there is no beginning it's called anadi beginningless so that's a cop out <laughs> you are avoiding the question how can it be beginningless you're just avoiding the charge of infinite regress in sanskrit it is called anavastha dosha reasoning without foundation you're trying to find a foundation a beginning and you can't find a beginning you say it's beginningless how can it be beginningless but this was explained to us very nicely by a professor of philosophy j n mahanti who passed away a couple of years ago master of both eastern and western thought he was a master of nyay school of advaita vedanta um and in in the west he studied husserl's phenomenology those who have read philosophy they know he studied it in germany in gottingen um so he told us that the same thing ignorance is beginningless how he said actually every ignorance is beginningless and i remember he asked us this question so how many this was in calcutta uh, how many of you know german none of us we we said we don't know german so you don't know german we said no we don't and since since when do you not know german oh, from our birth and he says oh so you before your birth you knew german no 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 it's beginningless isn't it the, be- the ignorance about anything about german about anything is beginningless and it comes to an end when you pick up the your first german book you know when you start learning german starts to uh, you know dispel the veil of ignorance so any kind of ignorance actually is beginningless and it comes to an end when knowledge is generated so that's the theory of vachaspati mishra traditional theory it is it seems to cleverly avoid both infinite regress and circular reasoning that's one the other classical theory is no 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 Ign- ignorance maya is in um, brahman really how can darkness be in brahman how can ignorance is an imperfection ignorance is a problem how can that be in the, your ultimate perfect reality non dual brahman well for brahman it isn't a problem it's a power its effect upon us Uh, is uh, veiling of the real nature of brahman and projecting this entire universe so for us it's a problem for brahman it's not a problem for brahman it's a power 
It's the power of Brahman by which it manifests this entire universe. So that's against standard Advaita Vedanta. Um, so that's when Brahman becomes the god of religion. Brahman plus this power is the god of religion, which projects this entire universe and all of us and so on and so forth. So these two answers. Um, where is ignorance? That's the question. The first answer, the real answer is, of course, it doesn't matter because it's not a real question. Um, from the perspective of the enlightened one. It's a very real question for philosophers. And again, it's not a real cause question for the most of us because we are not, we are not thinking in that way. It's a question if you think about it. Who thinks about it? The philosopher. Not the man in the, not the common man, not the enlightened man. <laughs> not the enlightened person. It's the in-between. The person who's trying to understand the whole thing says, it's, we can't understand it. Precisely. One, uh, and the two, two answers from classical Vedanta schools. The answer that it is in the sentient being and it avoids both um, circular reasoning and infinite, infinite regress from Vachaspati Mishra. So um, this is called the Bhavati school answer. And the other one is, no, no, it's a power of Brahman. That is the, what the school is called, Padmapada school, it's called the Vivarana school, just for those who want to know. Uh, and its effect on us is uh, ignorance, but the power is Maya. It's uh, the power of Brahman, power of God. Um, the way the monks in the Himalayas have explained it, uh, traditionally if you ask a monk, they are a non-dualist monk, what they'll say is, of course it doesn't make sense. When you say that it leads to the problem of infinite regress or circular reasoning, that's a fancy way, a logician's way of saying it doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't make sense. If it did make sense, then maya or ignorance would be real. Uh, it's a paradox. It has to be uh, paradoxical. If you push hard enough, you'll end up with the paradox. Because ultimately from an Advaita Vedanta perspective, only Brahman is real. You are Brahman and that's the reality. If all of this made sense, then it would probably be re a real thing. And then Advaita, non-duality wouldn't be real. Does that um, strike something? A dream, in a dream, if at any point we come across the illogicality of the dream and we ask somebody in the dream, this doesn't make sense. Is it a dream? Am I dreaming? Could be. And often you tend to wake up from a dream. And the answer would be, yes, it doesn't make sense because it is a dream. It is a dream. That's why it doesn't make sense. I was reading this and this universe doesn't make sense. Not just to us, but... Uh, to the deepest investigators of our, of our modern times. I was reading this book by Carlo Rovelli on quantum mechanics. He's an Italian quantum uh, physicist, a cutting edge physicist, but also a um, beautiful writer, a very evocative writer. So he describes our theories of the universe in, in classical mechanics, you know. This uh, whole physics describes universe at its most fundamental level as these vast empty spaces. Uh, conditioned by general relativity, uh, by gravity, and uh, these tiny, tiny particles pushing, pushed around by uh, forces racing through this universe and constituting planets and stars and living beings and so on. And then he says, after a very evocative description, uh, that's the fundamental nature of reality. And then he says, except it's not true. And that's what last hundred years, you know, nearly quantum mechanics is supposed to be showing us. I'm no expert at all on that, not even <laughs> close. I've just read some popular books. But these are books written by actual practicing scientists and very, very um, and deep thinkers. And they're saying none of this is actually true. Uh, and that's uh, uh, what he tries to say there is uh, this is because we are conditioned to think of reality as constituted of things. Uh, that there are cats and dogs and stars and planets and human beings and chairs and tables. He said, except at the quantum level, there are no things. And there are, and his uh, understanding of quantum mechanics, there are multiple understandings, but his understanding of quantum mechanics is um, things are only the way they interact with each other. So something becomes a thing with properties only when it's interacting with another so-called quote-unquote thing. It's only the way reality talks to itself that <laughs> appears as things and properties. It's very difficult to get your mind around such things. <laughs> yeah. But when I read that, 
the only thing that jumps out of the pages of the book to me again and again is it screams maya that's what the ancients were talking about when they talked about maya i mentioned how the holy mother uh, she said jamon bhav tem ni lab it conversation with one of his uh, her monastic disciples swami arupananda in bengali jamon bhav tem ni lab it means as your attitude the way you practice that kind of realization you will get so that means suppose you worship so it's shivaratri is coming you worship god as shiva and you're likely to have a uh, experience of god as shiva when you get a mystical experience so the monk whom she was talking to protested he said that's just like a dream i mean you think about something a lot it's going to come up in your dreams likely to so if you are going to practice this way meditate and you know chant and worship shiva and then you say because of that you get an experience of god as shiva that means you've just you know it's like an hallucination or a dream you've just stuffed your mind with that thought and that's coming up it's just a dream her answer was very interesting she didn't try to persuade him otherwise she said of course it's a dream what else is it except not a dream this is a dream <laughs> this is all a dream and then she pointed a finger and swept it across what she was see and the swami writes in his mem- memoirs within brackets jagrat avastha our waking world was what we consider to be real she is pointing it out this is a dream then he protests he says no but this is not a dream because this persists dreams come and go there are so many dreams every night this persists and he says maybe it has persisted over many lifetimes how can this be a dream and again she doesn't try to convince him she uh, she says in bengali ta holei ba shopno boi to noy let that be so it's nothing more than a dream it's nothing more than a dream that's what leads to those paradoxes i remember this book by john barrows he was a, is a mathematical philosopher mathematical physicist um he came here to, there's a new school uh, here i heard him speak on the um on unknowability it's there so he has got this book called impossibility and he says um there that any field in every field we feel that if you advance far enough physics mathematics biology whatever y- the feeling was you will complete the field you'll underst- get a full deep understanding and yet what we are seeing in just about every fundamental field of study in science is you're ending up with paradoxes incompletenesses whether it's mathematics godel's famous he was right here in, in the institute of advanced studies in princeton famous incompleteness theorems um or in physics uh, you have uh, this uh, yeah uh, this uh, uh, what is that called so einstein's relativity then uh, then this uh, um and uncertainty of the mass and uh, i think position of the particles yeah. heisenberg's uncertainty principle so just look at these terms relativity uncertainty incompleteness just the terms themselves i'm not going into the depths because i have no competence there so every field of study instead of being completed as we go deeper and get a better more sophisticated understanding Uh, it's not solving the mystery it's not giving completeness as yet at least it's just showing um, throwing up paradoxes okay um should we take one more question and then go into the audience questions yes shuman ike from Mal- malaysia asks what is the difference between consciousness awareness and mindfulness mm. consciousness awareness and mindfulness So I want to answer the question directly I'll take consciousness and awareness first um these are words which are ambiguous that's why in my talks on vedanta I use consciousness and awareness interchangeably because none of them precisely capture what uh, vedanta means by chaitanya chit chiti bodhi samvit and multiple words in vedanta it's something that they dealt with so they came up with <laughs> i always think of the eskimos are supposed to have some 20 words for snow or something like that they always live in a snowy environment so they have little variations of that so in that way these ancient indians came up with multiple words for that ultimate reality as pure consciousness um the buddhists have a very evocative phrase i don't know the original tibetan for this but it it says clear light of the void 
So the reality according to them is emptiness, but uh, it's a luminous em- emptiness. So uh, there is no, it's not exactly what is meant by consciousness or awareness, but that's the closest that we can get. Suppose it's, it's a bit like sunlight and moonlight. You want to explain what sunlight is, but to persons who are perpetually living at night, once in a while they see the moon, and so the only thing you can say is that, you know that moonlight, that's what I mean by sunlight. And you are right, but not quite. So the per- you know what it means, how the sunlight is becoming the moonlight. But the person who doesn't know what sunlight is can often be confused about what you mean. All right. So instead of saying consciousness, awareness, let me use precise terms which will be analogous or close to them and then differentiate. In Sanskrit, the terms are swarupa jnana, um, consciousness itself. Vritti jnana, consciousness in the mind. So these two terms, let me distinguish. Swarupa jnana, vritti jnana. There are multiple terms for these. So this vritti jnana, consciousness in the mind, uh, is what we are used to. Technically, this vritti jnana is what awareness or consciousness actually refer to. The English dictionary, if you take words like awareness, consciousness, they all refer to this vritti jnana. This is, this is the consciousness we are used to. When we are seeing, when we are hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, remembering, understanding, loving, hating, desiring, all of our conscious life, whatever we call it, is Ritti Jnana, is consciousness in the mind. And this is exactly like moonlight. That moonlight, sunlight example. And what Vedanta is trying to show us, so-called, if you call it pure consciousness, or awareness itself, or awareness of awareness, and so on, is not Vritti Jnana, is that Swarupa Jnana is, is consciousness itself, is the sunlight. The sunlight is there, but only at, at night you can't point to the sun directly. The only thing you can say is that that light you see, that's actually what I'm talking about. In reality it is sunlight. That moonlight you see, in reality is sunlight. That awareness which we have right now, totally, correctly understood, precisely understood, precisely ascertained, it is pure consciousness. Reflected through the mind. That's Vritti, Vritti Jnana. So I've made two distinctions. One of them is very familiar to all of us. That is, right now, we all feel that we are aware. We all feel we are conscious. And if you want to point to this consciousness, you want to point to this awareness, you can. But you can, will point to some kind of um, event. A mental, perceptual, cognitive event. That's what's going on now. Thinking, remembering, enjoying, hating, all of it. Waking, dreaming, sleeping, all of it is because of this uh, mind. But what uh, the Vedanta claims is all of this comes from, in all of this is involved and it is illumined by and it comes from uh, what it calls Swarupa, Jnana, Chit, Samvit, Bodhi, multiple words, pure consciousness. So this is the distinction. Vedanta, we are trying to find that out. Right now our problem is we are identified with this Ritti Jnana. We think, I am this guy. Uh, I am sitting here, I am talking to you. This is very obvious to me. But it's obvious to me only because I see, hear, smell, taste, touch. I think, I remember, uh, I cogitate and therefore it's obvious to me. It's all presented. So, uh, a very beautiful way of describing it in, you get in Vedanta, Buddhism also, Tibetan Buddhism. It's like a dreamlike appearance on the primordial ground that's what they call it dreamlike appearances on primordial ground what is the primordial ground you what's the dreamlike appearance this 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 what's going on inside our problem is we don't know the primordial ground we cling to the dreamlike appearances as because that's all we know but the dreamlike experiences themselves cling to the primordial ground the once you recognize the primordial ground in and through the and you can recognize the primordial ground because you are the primordial ground. Tattva Masi, you are that. Therefore it's entirely open to all of us to recognize what we truly are. So anyway, um, going from our mental consciousness, awareness, whatever you call it, to pure consciousness awareness, going means recognizing it. The ground, that's the primordial ground. I can say sunlight is the primordial ground of moonlight. It will be a weird way of talking, but uh, that's what I mean basically. One more term used was mindfulness. 
Now, there's a Sanskrit term which cor it corresponds to samanaska. Literally means attentive, mindful. Um, samanaska actually means mindful, literally mindful. <laughs> so, it's a term used in the Kathopanishad long before the Buddha. But this, it's very, it, mindfulness, of course, right now, the mindfulness we come across in the United States and many parts of the world, it draws upon Buddhist traditions. But uh, in many ways, the Buddhist tradition itself draws upon more ancient Hindu traditions, like the Buddha's own teachers were Sankhya masters, by his own admission. Um, so, Samanaska, what it does is, this, this Vritti Jnana, the consciousness in the mind, the moonlight, um, it's limited, but it reveals the world to us. It gives us a sense of personality, individual identity, like we feel now, and it reveals the world to us. And it's a, it has a very limited bandwidth, so it needs to be focused. The, what needs to be focused? The moonlight. Uh, now I'm stretching the analogy too far. <laughs> uh, so uh, what needs to be focused is our mind, and the consciousness in the, through the in and through the mind. So focusing means paying attention paying attention. So there is a huge amount of study being done now on focus, attention, mindfulness, positive psychology. Mihai Chikzen, Mihai's book Flow is a classic example, but a lot more work is being done. So paying attention, it's, it's the most important resource that we have uh, to attend to something, to pay attention. All knowledge depends upon paying attention. Because the limited bandwidth we have, we need to focus in on whatever. It, it, it does all miracles for us. All our enlightenment, spirituality, science, religion is because we pay attention. Then it works. So that paying attention is mindfulness. That focusing of our um, vritti jnana is mindfulness. So that's the link. All right. Um, questions? Sir? Yes. Uh, who, who was... Uh, I'll, the lady there, can you come up here um, and ask, tell us your name and ask the question. And in between the clarification, yes. When you say vritti jnana, do you, is it synonymous with reflected consciousness? So the question is, when you say vritti jnana, is it synonymous with reflected consciousness? Yes, consciousness is reflected in the vritti. Vritti means movement of the mind. So every mental movement that we are aware of, we are aware of only because consciousness is reflected in that. So that's vritti jnana. Yes, tell us your name and ask the question. Hello, my name is Jane. Yes. Um, I have a question about exper my, an experience. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if it's a process of didiasana. Um, so a brief description of this experience is um, Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Um, so a brief what happened? I think you have lost the mic. mic. Just speak into it. So, yeah. yes. Um, so at times when I'm in bed going to sleep, uh, I'm aware that the body is going into sleep mode while the mind is extremely lucid and placid. Understand that Everything happens in us consciousness, but my mind is now trying to put a finger on whether it's a process of something, what it's all about. So, thanks. Okay. So what happens in the mind is a process. The mind is always working and it works in sequence, so it's a process. Waking is a process. Falling asleep, transition from waking to uh, sleep is a process. Then generation of dreams is a process, and then waking up again is a process. But um, the luminosity which illumines consciousness itself, uh, which illumines the mind itself in waking, dreaming, deep sleep, that's not a process. It's, it's always there. Now, would you say it's static in relation to the changing mind? It's static, but it's static is also not a right way of describing it. Because static means the possibility of motion. When something is still, you are static, you are not moving, but you can move. Pure consciousness, Atman, Brahman, is, um, is neither, there is certainly no activity going on there, but there is certainly, it's not something that's still also. It's beyond the possibility of stillness. It's the witness of stillness and activity, let's put it that way. It's the ground of both stillness and activity. In itself, you cannot predicate stillness and activity to it. 
Um, for example, waking and dreaming are processes and there's activity going on. Whereas deep sleep seems to be not a process, stillness, complete cessation, phenomenological from our perspective. Of course, the body, if you examine it in the brain, something is going on. But in, uh, for us, blank. So that's stillness. And waking and dreaming are activity. But these are all three of them are appearing and disappearing to you, the witness consciousness. So that witness consciousness is the witness of both stillness and activity, of the process and the not process. Yeah, thank you. That's a subtle question. <laughs> thank you. Um, one more question. The gentleman right at the back. Yes, right at the back. Please come forward. Uh, I'll, I'll come to you next time. Yes. Please tell us your name and ask the question. Namaste. My name is Wali Mohammed. Um, is okay. Does existence manifest from consciousness? Uh, my understanding from my studies thus far are that everything exists within consciousness. Um, but does existence manifest from consciousness? Is it the quality of consciousness? Is it the ground of consciousness? I can give you a precise answer from the Vedantic perspective. Existing, according to Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, existing things manifest from consciousness. Existing things in the Heideggerian sense. Existence itself, of course, does not manifest from consciousness because consciousness itself exists. If existence were something that consciousness manifests, then prior to existence, consciousness would be non-existent. So existence and consciousness are uh, the same thing. From a Vedantic perspective, pure being and pure awareness are the same thing. Existence, awareness in the sense of um, just the luminosity. Uh, just, it's not a dull, dead object existence. Uh, it's uh, shining existence, let's put it that way. And yes, it manifests as existing things, as tables and chairs and people and thoughts and ideas as waking, dreaming, deep sleep and all of that. Thank you. All right. Um, let's take a um, couple of questions again. We actually have two questions on a similar theme. Okay. Um, firstly, there's Chandra Sekhar who asks, Swamiji, if everything in the universe, both living and non-living, is just appearances created by Upadis and Maya, is it also true that the Shukshma Shariram and the different lokas it might go to is all just Maya created appearances? Is it the Shukshma Shariram that takes birth after birth due to karma? What really happens during self-realization? Who realizes that I am not the body-mind complex, but the supreme consciousness? And secondly, Hardik Patak from, U from the UK asks, when we say we are not the body, mind, and intellect, and Atman is Brahman, then who goes to hell, heaven, or the locus? Who suffers or who benefits? Hmm. Similar questions, you're right. All right, this is another of those questions which comes up when you think too deeply about non-dualists. <laughs> yeah, and it's good to clarify. All right, the standard answer first. The standard answer is this. It's good to know these things. That See, we have a physical body, subtle body, and of course a causal body, but we'll not talk about that now. But the physical body and the, and the um, subtle body. Physical body is this, the public one, which everybody sees. That's a physical body. And the subtle body is nothing occult or mysterious. Everybody knows it and is experiencing it right now. We are all experiencing it. Our first person inner experience of thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, our personality. In Vedanta, that's considered a body. Just like this is considered a body. This is a body. That's also a body. That's not the way we normally think. We think those thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, memories, stories. We are that. I am that and I am embodied in this body. I'm a person and that's what constitutes a person. Vedanta would say what you think of as a person is also a body. The real you is deeper still, is a deeper reality. Beyond that is something Vedanta calls a causal body, but we won't go into that. Beyond that causal body is also 
uh, is is you the witness consciousness the wit the uh, awareness itself pure consciousness which experiences and uses the subtle causal body subtle body and physical body now the idea is this being pure consciousness limited by causal body subtle body physical body it goes through births and deaths what are births and deaths birth of the physical body growth and living of the physical body and then the aging and eventual death of the physical body then what happens to the causal body and the subtle body they continue they were there before this physical body and they will continue after the physical body again nothing new every culture in the world from pre civilization uh, <laughs> days has stories about ghosts and you know things which are ex- which exist after death so yes the subtle body does exist after that we g- exist after death when the computer dies your data hopefully if it's backed up is not gone with it it's still there in the cloud <laughs> and you get a new computer you can download your data if you're lucky similarly this uh, subtle body it goes on and um, it inhabits newer and newer bodies and this is sort of a standard belief uh, st- axiomatic in indian uh, thought i'm not just saying vedanta all indian thought all indian thought except perhaps the materialists the charvakas lokayatas they were ancient materialists other than them all hindus all jains all buddhists all sikhs they believe in multiplicity and the subtle body is something that every civilization all religions and all civilizations including the first nations including ancient every ancient civilization every ancient religion that existed and gone out of existence everybody in, had something corresponding to the subtle body the thing which survives physical death um so what happens at death the subtle body and the causal body with the limited consciousness consciousness limited by them it leaves this dead body and goes on to other bodies how why filled by past karma by causality causes give rise to effects actions have consequences so it will give rise to new and new existences so this is the general framework um advaita vedanta has a different take on it he says yeah this is the general framework it's a story because they will always they will go back to non duality you are that non dual brahman existence consciousness bliss in which these things again that that uh, beautiful phrase of magical appearances dream like appearances on the primordial ground the primordial ground is you you have never gone anywhere never been born never died nor are you going to you know nor are you in bondage in samsara nor are you going to get moksha or nirvana because you always moksha nirvana freedom is always your real nature but you're going to realize that we're going to realize what was always there so that's the advaitic frame if that was always there then this question might arise who is coming and going or what's all this birth and death what heaven and hell none of it none of it uh, only from the ultimate perspective from the transactional perspective just because i've heard this now when i die i will not go to hell or heaven no you will <laughs> don't confuse the reality with the movie you know the reality the movie is going to play out yeah. now what happens upon enlightenment upon enlightenment again upanishads talk about this see upon ordinary physical death the unenlightened person body dies we are fully identified with this limited subtle body we go on to other lives but the enlightened one knows that i am that primordial ground i am brahman i am atman this entire body mind the whole thing from beginningless time was an illusion was an appearance was a dream in me even time and space itself were dreams in me just very much like dream time and dream space yeah. they are appearances they are part of the dream the reality is i am the ground of that dream once you realize that you realize they never were past births there never was this particular birth also in reality you were just this then what happens we might say that's all very fancy stuff but i want to know practically this person the so called enlightened one dies how is it different from another non enlightened person dying the difference is this again from the munda kopanishad that the physical body d- it goes back to nature for uh, enlightened and non enlightened alike and the subtle body for the un- unenlightened goes on to other existences continues its spiritual journey but the enlightened one the subtle body is no longer useful so it goes back to uh, na- again to nature even the subtle body is a body even the physical body is a body and both are products of nature our work is done 
nature's work is done nature is done with us nature says goodbye mm -hmm. it's a very ancient thought long before our modern vedanta there was sankhya vivekananda said it's the first philosophy of the human race and sankhya considers nature to be the great mother great mother and there's a beautiful verse it says there's a trackless desert of this universe vast lifeless cold you know like space and stars and planets uh, and universes after universes this is the trackless desert of the universe and that ancient mother we are her children the sentient beings she cradles us and takes us across this desert and delivers us on the far shore far shore is the primordial ground is luminosity whatever it is our real nature and then bids us good goodbye because we are safe now but her work is not done tirelessly she comes back again to guide other children across <laughs> so that's what what does nature do sankhya philosophy um bhoga uh, apavarga bhoga means experience bhoga means experience pleasure and pain often is translated as enjoyment but bhoga means both enjoyment and pain um, so nature provides us with that lifetime after lifetime for what for our evolution and what else does it do ultimately it gives us release moksha apavarga is an ancient word for moksha moksha nirvana whatever you call it salvation it frees us from this ceaseless cycle of birth and death so that's what happens upon uh, there's a difference what happens to an enlightened person and not a non enlightened person um the the second question was similar question the second question 3.2 i think the third question when we say we are not the body mind and intellect and atman is brahman then who goes to hell heaven or the lokas who suffers or who benefits yes now we can answer it it's the unenlightened one who thinks i am the body mind thinks not only thinks is absolutely convinced i am this body and mind and the body is dying i am dying and then what happens oh i didn't die wow but unfortunately it forgets all of that and then goes to other lokas other worlds and is born in different forms and is identified with those bodies and they die too <laughs> and it goes on in this way so it is the sentient being who is subject to ignorance who goes from lifetime to lifetime from birth to death the one who sees who is enlightened enlightened means open in language of the upanishads the one who sees oneness and i am that oneness is freed from this cycle of birth and death Yes who was raising uh, their hand yeah if you remember your question come <laughs> tell us your name and ask the question Hello Namaskar <laughs> Swami ji um thank you uh shraddha ebong kritokota apnar proti my name is Sadia yeah. um i will ask a more simple question because of time um and that is How does a lay person go about choosing a life partner that flourish into a healthy relationship and at the same time stay true to the divine path? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> that that threw me. Yes. You realize you're asking a monk. <laughs> yeah. Um the rather dreary and disappointing answer is that it's all predetermined by our prarabdha karma <laughs> we only think you are choosing but you so, sort of end up with what we deserve um uh, what we are fated to yeah but some practical advice but it's it's not entirely out of the realm of spirituality because these are relationships which are very very important and uh, um because they consume so much of our time and energy Uh, it's v it's very important to uh, have somebody who's like-minded who has got some spiritual aspiration might not be exactly the same as you have i've seen couples who are um, spiritual both of them are uh, spiritual maybe in different ways uh, that's perfectly fine if you're spiritual in the same way even better that's also wonderful but if you have sp some spiritual inclination and a serious spiritual practice uh, that's very good Uh, otherwise there's too much friction um 
somebody is pulling you towards the world and somebody is pulling you to towards something that seems very otherworldly and then it leads to unhappiness it leads to um, there is no fulfillment in the world at all both of them are jumping into the world and we say let's so we are all uh, like minded and we are both like minded in the worldly sense well we are you both of the you are going to be likely to be very unhappy <laughs> after some time and then maturity comes some kind of spiritual uh, awakening awakening or interest in spiritual life comes so yes this much only i can suggest is uh, that choose a life partner if possible uh, who has some interest in spirituality i mean takes it seriously in his or her own way okay that's a good one thank you <laughs> <laughs> can we it's getting a little warm in there can you open one of the windows for for a little while maybe it can or the door outside it will give some ventilation uh we'll take one more question the gentleman there yes come up here i'll come to you next uh hello swami ji my name is jwalin um my question relates to uh swami vivekanand's theory of karma yoga as a way to achieve enlightenment personally i'm having trouble connecting that with what's discussed here in the talks with the knowledge of brahman and atman i don't understand how that realization can come come from something like karma yoga or bhakti yoga which seems much more dualist yes the reason you are having difficulty in relating that to what we are talking here is because we are not talking about it we are talking about uh, gyana yoga or advaita vedanta which is primarily what i talk about here that's why uh, uh you finding it difficult to relate what's the relationship first i'll tell you about the relationship between karma and knowledge in the classical advaita framework the classical advaita framework is karma action in the world is very important uh, for generating knowledge it it helps us but only in a secondary sense it will not directly lead to enlightenment that was the position of shankara and all his uh, followers it will not directly lead to enlightenment what it can do is purify our minds when we pursue karma in the worldly sense i'm doing something to get something then it just conditions the mind with desire and uh, um, lack of fulfillment and we want more and more and we try in different ways to become fulfilled here um whereas if we do the same karma in an in the, uh, as a spiritual practice not for i me myself but whatever work i'm doing in the office in any in, in your job in your career at at home and more importantly the work which i selflessly do for others without wanting anything back all of that is karma yoga and you do it in a uh, spirit of dedication to god or ishwar or bhagwan that purifies the mind how does it do so the greatest impurity is selfishness selfishness is that which binds us to this body mind advaita is in- interested in that see all the discussions we are having is identification with this body mind identification with the vritti gyana with the individual with the moonlight uh, let's say so that identification is strengthened by um the more selfish action we keep on doing lifetime after lifetime the more we feel i am this one and i have individual projects to attain whereas selfless action begins to purify the mind and you begin to see that you are not really this little i me mind you already are not then gyana yoga it takes hold in an impure deeply selfish deeply identified with body mind the, the knowledge of brahman does not take hold in hindi they say baithta nahi hai doesn't sit well if all our thinking and our daily life is i me mind and then once in a while i read i am brahman it won't make much sense Uh, if i purify the mind that is it begin to see that oh this i me mind is a sort of childish um, this body and the other bodies and other people they are all the same basically we are all one being or at least one consciousness consciousness in and through various bodies and mind this much feeling also will become more and more real and more and more obvious then the understanding i am brahman will become very clear to us so it is very helpful karma yoga is very helpful um, gyana yoga takes a rather dim view of of karma itself that not only karma any kind of practice there is a beautiful verse in dashtavakra which says shuddham buddham priyam purnam 
निष्प्रपंचम निरामय आत्मा तम न जानती त्राभ्यास त्राभ्यास प्रयोजना त्राभ्यास परो जना पीपल डू नॉट नो दम सेल्स एज दिस प्योर बीइंग प्योर बीइंग मीन्स बियॉन्ड कर्म गुड एंड बैड दे डू नॉट नो दम सेल्स एज दिस इज शुद्धम बुद्धम दे डू नॉट नो दम सेल्स एज दिस लिमिटलेस कॉन्शियसनेस विटनेस कॉन्शियसनेस Priyam, they do not know themselves as the source of all fulfillment and happiness. That's why they are we are running around. You know, you're a billionaire basically, running running around with a hat in hand for a little handout from the world. You're a billionaire. You don't need anything from the world. Nisarga Dutta Maharaj was a non-dualist in Mumbai. He says this very this world. this actually his his uh, words were this very sense of being or presence which i have now even this also i have no use for we say i am not the body not the mind a pure consciousness pure awareness this pure consciousness pure awareness is also mediated through the mind he says even this i have no use for even before you say i am i am the witness you are even before you say that you don't need to say it so this is priyam i don't need anything from outside anyway then it goes on to say purnam it is complete in itself it's not that there is one pure consciousness and there is a world from which it needs to draw sustenance no the world is an appearance it's not ultimately real so next word nishprapancham it's free of this prapancha means this worldly display made of five elements physical world mental world is free of all of that and niramayam free of therefore free of all suffering old age body disease body and prana hunger and thirst hunger and thirst prana um frustration unhappiness mind manas ignorance confusion buddhi intellect but pure consciousness is free of all of them is a witness to all of them their presence uh, arrival and dis- uh, disappearance and coming back again uh, so uh, you are the witness consciousness and free of niramayam free of all disease of of all ailment of all suffering of all negativity of all impurity you have no problem at all is you realize that and you stay with it those who do not know it atmanam tam na jananti those who do not know this as their own self they don't know themselves as this what we are talking about what do they become tatra abhyasa paro jana they become uh, they become dedicated to practice what does that practice mean it means everything that you do in this world you out to make a million bucks on wall street that's practice because you think that will lead to fulfillment it won't but it's good to go through that experience <laughs> what will happen if you don't make a million bucks you'll be frustrated if you make a million bucks you'll be dissatisfied only two things <laughs> only two possibilities but it's good it's good to learn this it's good good to go through that and learn it all right so i don't want a million bucks i i'm going to give it all up i'm going to go to um Columbia University or NYU and get a PhD no i i am dedicated to knowledge try that that's also practice yeah. and that's dry knowledge i think this iris murdock i think the great uh, british novelist she was a, f- a philosopher before that of uh what was she irish i um so uh, i mean <laughs> So she was a well-trained analytic philosopher and I think in Cambridge or Oxford somewhere but she gave it up because she said I can do better philosophy in writing novels than I can uh, do at at Cambridge University. So I give up for knowledge I am a pursuit of knowledge for for art try it. Abhyasa <laughs> para. Yeah. It's sacrilege to say these things in Manhattan. We have got the museum mile on the east side there it's the whole place is dedicated to art. So that's the religion of the 20th century. the whole idea was we can replace god we can we're going to throw god out and replace god with art 
um, replace God with social causes, um, replace God with something of the other, something of the other. And what happened? None of them were. They are not good replacements. God, for all his faults, old Karmajan that he is, but he is bigger than all of this. That's what we are, the late 20th century and early 21st century is dedicated to rediscovering this. So, Abhyasapara. Uh, then we give it all up. Oh, all right, so I have come to my senses. Now I'm going to be a spiritual practitioner. Karma, Karma Yoga. Meditation, Dhyana Yoga, Devotion, and you know, Bhakti Yoga, and Vedanta, Shavana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Right? Ashtavakra says, No, you're still Abhyasa Parajana. You're still practicing. Because you don't know what you are. The moment you know what you are, you will throw the whole lot into the trash heap. Not actually. See, it's very subtle. You internally, you don't have any need of these things anymore. Because what you have discovered by your, ultimately by your spiritual practice, what you discover is that it's already naturally yours. It's not dependent on spiritual practices. It's not even dependent on Vedantic teachings. In fact, a stage comes when you will see the final obstruction are these words. You have found it. And then you keep hearing the Swami said, it's pure consciousness, I'm Atman, I'm Brahman, I'm the witness. And you will find these words itself are the last hurdle. It let go. People make a mistake that at least we have to hold on to this teaching, right? I let go of everything else. I have to hold on to Vedanta only, only as long as we are in ignorance. When you are enlightened, you have to let go of Vedanta. Uh, Upanishad say, Datra ye Veda, Veda Bhavanti, where the Vedas are no Vedas at all. <laughs> so once you have discovered, of course, once you have discovered that, you let it go earlier at your own peril. It's the pole vaulter who races along and then vaults up to the highest um, height he can, he or she can. And then the pole vaulter has to let go of the pole. If you say, no, it's taken me so far, I'm dependent on it. <laughs> no, let go. Then only you can go over the barrier, you can cross over into enlightenment and freedom. Oh, I let go. So when I'm running around, let go, okay, let go. I don't want it. The master told me that's the most advanced practice to let go. <laughs> well, then also you're in trouble. So this is the traditional idea about karma yoga, that it's the part of the pole vaulting, the pole that includes many other things also, devotional practices and at its basis ethics. All of these are the pole which will catapult you. And the final thing is the Vedantic, the innermost practices are the Vedantic hearing, reasoning, and meditation. Now Swami Vivekananda, he says to Swami Turiyananda, who was also Vivekan Turiyananda, were both here, not in this building, but both the Vedanta Society of New York at one time. He says to uh, Turiyananda in India, he says, Hari Bhai, he used to call him Bhaya, <laughs> brother. Brother, in this age, I have, I have made a new path, as in or days of old. Young men and women, as in days of old, there was meditation and prayer and you know, philosophical inquiry. In the days to come, there will be young men and women. He specifically mentions women. Young men and women, I see them working out their way to salvation through karma, through the path of service. So that's an entirely different yoga. I'm not going to go into that. Um, the paradigm is different there. The problem is this selfish clinging to a person, personality, and the solution is a direct attack on that selfishness. And Classical Advaita would say, yeah, that's great, but finally you have to come and you know, Upanishads and uh, you have to come to Vedanta class. Swami Vivekananda says, not necessarily. Your real nature is already there. Remove the veil of selfishness and what else remains? It should very easily shine forth. You don't have to put much, forth, much effort into it. In fact, the other way around, those who have not put effort into Karma Yoga and they rush into Jnana Yoga because I want the best. It's like they're letting go of the pole or not using the pole at all. <laughs> And then uh, your jump falls far short of the... <laughs> yeah, yeah, so this is the difference. I highly recommend Karma Yoga, the little book, Swami Vivekananda, uh, that book. Um, what's his name? J.D. Salinger, the novelist. He, uh, he writes, these two little classics, Karma Yoga and Raja Yoga, about Vivekananda's two books, these two little classics, our American youth would do well to carry around in their pockets. This was in the 1960s, I think. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, one lady was there. She raised her hand. Would you come here for the question? Yes. If you remember the question. Often people forget. 
tell us your name and ask the question my name is swami ji tanuka i actually i think you just answered most Good. of the question <laughs> uh so my question was about practicing vairagya uh detachment it's something i've been thinking about for a long time and trying to understand um and a few sundays back i you gave a very beautiful um suggestion of practicing vairagya by th- looking at everything as divine play play of the divine i think that was really powerful um thank you very much for that so uh, my question today was about is there a, a non dual way of understanding the practice of vairagya and um i think yes. you spoke yeah, to it vairagya it's it's very important to practice vairagya one is to move as i said um so as a four yoga the structure puts it move from selfish action to selfless action even when it outwardly might seem selfish because you are holding a job and getting a you're getting paid for it so it seems selfish but internally you have changed you are not no longer doing it for the sake of that money yes the money is good because you have to live anyway you need money um uh, then but your whole goal is now using that work as a worship of god uh, so that's why ragya too and vairagya means dispassion for worldly goals the classical advaita vedanta has a very high view of vairagya i mean it's very important for advaita vedanta to not to catch hold of, because if it's a dream and you're clutching on to the dream as real that could that's the serious obstruction to enlightenment so at three levels uh, at the highest level as you said it's a play of the divine everything here is nothing other than brahman isha upanishad speaks to that ईशा वास्यम इदम सर्व यत्किंच जगत्याम जगत हम कवर एवरीथिंग हियर बाय द लॉर्ड बाय ब्राह्मण दैट एवरीथिंग इज दिस वन डिविनिटी एंड हाउ व्हाट डू यू मीन कवर शंकराचार्य एक्सप्लेन्स कवर मींस मींस टू अनकवर इट्स ऑलरेडी देयर व्हाट डू यू मीन अनकवर ही सेज अनकवर मींस टू डिस्कवर इन हिज कमेंटरी ही सेज हाउ डू यू डिस्कवर एंड ही गिव्स सम गिव्स सम एग्जांपल्स so basically by the vedantic method of inquiry who am i so that you discover but you discover the reality here is divine and shankar and the upanishad says tena tyaktena bhunjita by that renunciation so this is renunciation one renunciation is actually give up everything and run away to a forest or a monastery or something the other one is you see everything as brahman so um, as the atman itself if that's too difficult one step lower easier easier is to see everything as a dream you might say that's more difficult no it isn't the first one is the highest to see everything inside outside everything is that one divinity it's difficult actually the second step is to see everything as a dream that's actually a uh, easier approach third is even if you can't see it as a dream just see everything as um, the processes of material nature five elements interacting with each other matter energy time space it should not be it's not all that difficult different from what a scientist sees this world as so somebody is abusive towards you it's just a whirl of uh, atoms whirling around and some, some waves in the uh, coming to the ear and setting up vibrations what is it to me <laughs> it's as difficult as that <laughs> all right thank you can we take up a couple of more questions yes a clarification when you say see brahman in everything hmm or if you have attended lots of classes and watched many youtube videos <laughs> you can't really do it but you feel you can do it so try <laughs> yeah yes uh, this question is from saitu shivastav from india you have mentioned many times that realizing the self is not a mystical experience and that by the practice of jigrisha viveka panchakosha viveka or avashta chaya we can intellectually understand and realize the self but i am unable to understand how since whatever we think and reflect on is in the mind and atma is said to witness the mind itself could you please answer this question as many of us in the world cannot attain mystical experiences like nirvikalpa samadhi all right i see multiple um questions there first of all you have said um the realization is not a mystical experience i have never said that uh, there are multiple mi- genuine mystical experiences in spiritual life sri ramakrishna's life is full of that i have a book in my li- uh, personal library which is, which is called sri ram jesus and sri ramakrishna super mystics 
<laughs> so there have been great mystics in spiritual his history of spirituality and uh, those are genuine mystical experiences of the divine and they at least to my way of thinking and Sri Ramakrishna's uh, way of thinking they count as realization however what I'm saying is in this specific approach that is that I speak about the classical Advaita Vedanta perspective you don't have to rely on a particular mystical experience it's an investigation based on reasoning and experience and that is drawn on the basis of the Upanishads which is based on so what is called Shruti Yukti Anubhuti grounded on the text, scriptural texts based on reasoning and matching with our experience you come to the realization that I am Brahman it is not entirely intellectual you can't argue your way to enlightenment <laughs> um, what happens is this in the, in the path of knowledge when we reason it out and we understand what is meant by Atman or Brahman we understand by looking at the moonlight what is meant by that that sunlight can you understand the sunlight by pointing to the moon and showing that that sunlight you understand the whole thing how, how it's happening once you know that how do you realize you are the sun how do you realize you are the Atman because you are the Atman if it was something else you're talking about, then it would be an intellectual understanding. But because it's you you're talking about, it's I, I, I'm talking about myself. The Upanishad is telling me about I, myself. The Vedantic teachings are telling me about myself. In that case, the intellectual understanding of this Atman or Brahman will deepen into self-realization. Because this self is continuously available to us. It's just we are not seeing it. What will happen by this intellectual understanding is it dispels the ignorance about ourselves. The mists of ignorance are dispelled because I am present to myself all the time. Just that what I am was not clear earlier. It becomes clear. So do you have to believe it that you are Atman or Brahman? Again, no. Many people understand or misunderstand Vedanta that way. That we are being asked to believe that this evident self which you cannot dismiss this is limitless consciousness, I have to just take it on faith. Not at all. You have to see for yourself. You have to see for yourself. So the story of the ten uh, people who crossed the river, I've told it ad nauseum, you know. Uh, so, how many of you know the story, the ten people who crossed the river? So many people know the story. Others you can look it up. <laughs> <laughs> so finally when somebody said, you are the tenth. You know, that guy was making a mistake counting the others, not counting himself. There are only nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the wise man said, ten. You are the ten. Now when I am told I am the tenth, do I say, yeah, I intellectually understand I am the tenth, but how am I to find the tenth in reality? That means you have not understood. I see those in reality. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And you are telling me I am the tenth, so okay, I'll believe you. No, 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 you haven't got it. So it has to be like that. Because I am the tenth is continuously available to me. I am available to myself. It's only that I am the tenth that was not very clear to me. Uh, that becomes clear to me. You are there. Who, de who can deny it? I am there. I am here. But I am this limitless existence consciousness place. That I am not clear about. And Vedanta shows me. Not believe. So this is. Yes. The intellect is heavily implicated. Involved there. But. It's beyond, as, you, as the person said, all these are still in the mind. True, they are in the mind, but they are pointing to something which is continuously available to you, because you are it. So the, the realization in the mind points back to you. When you realize you are that, hmm, you are that. Otherwise, a person when you are told that you are the tenth, and if I say, that's just in the mind, but <laughs> how am I the tenth in reality? How am I to know that in reality I am the tenth? No, 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 no. Ignorance is in the mind, knowledge will rise in the mind and dispel the ignorance. One rule of knowledge and ignorance is where the ignorance is, there the knowledge must rise. The ignorance is in the disciple, knowledge is in the guru, won't work. Then the ignorance has to arise in the disciple, then only the ignorance in the mind of the, the knowledge has to arise in the disciple, then only the ignorance in the mind of the disciple will be dispelled. Right? Um, so yes, one last part of that question was? The last sentence. Oh, 
So for ordinary people, we cannot attain to mystical. No, 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 why, why can you not? They are difficult. The path of knowledge and the path of mystical experience, both are available, both are difficult, uh, both require spiritual practice. It's not a question of us, ordinary people. Nirvikalpa Samadhi is not easy for anybody to attain. So the path of mystical experience and Samadhis are available for everybody. And in fact, they are highly recommended. Sri Ramakrishna says, no matter how much you do this reasoning, Vedanta, unless one attains to Samadhi, he says in Bengali, thik, thik um, how do you put it? It's not rightly done, it's not completely done yet. Uh, unless you have this complete shutting down of the world experience and the body-mind experience, and that alone. Then you bring it back into this world of appearances. You experience the primordial ground as the primordial ground, as you yourself, not as an object. And then when you are back into this world of dream displays, you still know that this is the primordial ground, though it appears like this. You know it. No, don't believe it. You know it. All right. Well, let's do one more. Exactly. Okay. It's, uh, again, two people with a similar question. Uh, Shrikar Vekula from Washington, D.C. says, During meditation and in daily life, I experience brief moments of oneness where the mind becomes completely silent and the absolute truth of Brahman is clearly and directly experienced. In that state, which is completely inexpressible in words, everything seems perfect and nothing more is needed. However, these moments remain brief despite my spiritual practices. What can I do to stay in this state and prevent my mind from falling back to matters of the world? And, and again, a similar question from Jana Matova from the Czech Republic. For many years now, I have felt a tiny but everlasting happiness somewhere in my chest, something which is still the same, unchanging, and keeps me feeling fulfilled. I believe that self-realization is for me the only possible and acceptable goal of this life. In that pursuit, I am a bit confused if I am to follow some of the four yogas. I am naturally inclined toward jnana yoga and karma yoga, which I am doing. A bit of bhakti yoga too, but meditation is probably not for me. But I am still turned within to the feeling of joy. Is there anything for me which can support the re realization to happen? Any advice would be highly appreciated. All right, this is beautiful. Both of them yes. have a similar um, experience and a similar question. Yes. So by meditation or without meditation, in the second case. So one experiences this moment of absolute quiet, peace, and one feels... This is inexpressible in words, but a limitless Brahman that is perfect, it's, it's all right there. Um, the only problem is that I come back again into this world and those states are very far and few in, in between. How do I make that permanent? All right. Here is the thing. When you're in that state of there's no world, the body is absolutely still, the mind is turned inwards, the breath is rhythmic or stilled for a brief while, and the mind becomes absolutely still, and you know that you are this background radiance to which all of these were ap appearing, and this absolute quiet stillness, which is problem free. Um, now, ask yourself the question now. Because you, if it was a really well done stillness, you can't ask any question there. The moment you ask a question, that's mental noise. But ask yourself the question now. That stillness was experienced. It was also an experience. That's why you're talking about it now. It was a wonderful experience. What experienced that stillness? One question. Then note, that which experienced that stillness is also, is it not, is also the experiencer of this not stillness when all of this is going on. You know? And you ask, where did that go? Oh, that wonderful stillness and peace. Now there's no peace. How will I go back there? 
the one which is experiencing this is it not the same one which was experiencing that stillness do you see what i'm saying and that one which experienced that stillness which illumined that stillness which irradiated the clear light of the void in the language of the tibetan buddhists that one which is you is also exactly the same one right now it is that one which is shining through the ears and eyes and nose and tongue and skin it is that one which is shining through the mind and memory and intellect it is that one which is illumining pain and pleasure and expectation and anxiety and all of that isn't it the same consciousness isn't it the same being same um, existence awareness isness awareness it's the same one and it was free of problems at that time it's also free of problems right now what happened to it now nothing happened except this display is ap appearing it becomes problematic when that one becomes identified with part of the display part of the display is this body part of the display are these thoughts and i say i am this you're done for without being identified in knowledge without being identified in your understanding you can still you know drive a car without thinking you are a car you can still navigate life as this limitless peace and joy and illumination luminosity what i'm saying is advaita vedanta is not meant for erasing the world experience it's meant for extending the peace of nirvikalpa samadhi into the world experience take this take this away from from this discussion what is there in deep sleep in our our deep sleep whatever we experience think about deep sleep how there was really nothing there at all and take this away right now in the midst of manhattan in all of this business a uh, busyness and business uh, in the midst of all of this is exactly nothing at all whatever there was in deep sleep there is now whatever there was not in deep sleep you see but there's nothing in deep sleep exactly there's nothing now what does this do it sets you free now in the midst of what advaita vedanta says in the midst of the world appearance also it makes you abadhita that i had heard very difficult to translate that term literally it means without barriers without limitations without it makes you infinite in the midst of this this world we get into trouble because we identify ourselves with a slice of this display and then interact with the rest of the display i am this one and the rest are not me there are some friends there are some enemies there are some people i'm indifferent to there are goals to be achieved things to be avoided and struggle through life as long so uh, as this little body lasts this is what we think ashtavakra says either all of it is me because all of it this world this body this mind is all presented to me the consciousness at once either it is all me it is all i or none of it is how do we dream actually in our dreams we fall asleep we forget that you are sleeping safely on the bed then we are inserted into a world there are things happening in the world pleasant or unpleasant and we are also present in that world and because we have identified ourselves with the dream character then all the dream things if you took a dreamer's perspective of the whole world you would be safe from the dream but you are not taking the dreamer's perspective you are taking the perspective of i in the dream not knowing it's a dream even if you are in i in the dream knowing it's a dream still you would be safe but we don't know it's a dream and that's why we take everything so seriously there here also all right so in deep meditation take that into practice see this is the core of advanced spiritual practice whether meditation or karma yoga or bhakti and gyana yoga this is the this is a principle of advanced practice when you are doing the practice at one point you must dissolve the barrier between practice and life dissolve the barrier between practice and life what is clear in practice in meditation in vedanta and all of that should be as we open our eyes as we walk out of this place it should be clear and boundaryless but it's there that's life now then it's done then according to uh, swami brahmananda then your spiritual life begins <laughs> before that you're trying 
we are trying he says spiritual life begins after nirvikalpa samadhi he said yeah. yeah so that's a very high note to end on practical advice as he said what do i and any advice would be uh, uh, welcome this is the core I've, i have talked about it as best as i can indicate it however as he said karma bhakti meditation whether you can do it well whether we cannot do it well whether it feels uh, mechanical uh, i am not getting it it's good to practice again a lama very um, nicely it's uh, something he didn't tell me i read it in a book this, uh, there were multiple warnings after the teaching of the highest non dual teachings in tibetan buddhism zogchen like advaita vedanta the warnings are yes you and your guru are one never forget to show respect to your guru yes it is the same thing with eyes closed and with eyes open never neglect your meditation yes it's the same thing in the city and in the forest but whenever you get a chance to go into a retreat never miss a retreat so like this uh, multiple warnings it is the same no doubt about it but for that purpose don't make the terrible mistake of giving up spiritual practices and telling the guru that yeah okay old guy i know what you are and i am we are the same you know i know that now <laughs> god save you then <laughs> yeah those are also traps of the mind all right on that cautionary note let us end with a peace chant Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Parnamastu Oh yes the basket yes the basket you can use the time for clarifications <laughs> questions uh, yeah we can we can even anybody wants to follow yeah, you had a question right so just just ask What's the light path in the dark path? Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is not to do with meditation. That's to do with the uh, destiny of the sentient being, the soul, sentient being after death. Some go along the path of darkness. Some go along the path of of light. But those are both are for unenlightened beings. The the those who have practiced the higher meditations, they go through what is called the path of the sun or the bright path. Yeah. and those who have not they go to the moon, path of the moon or the dark path and they go to the heavens of the ancestors so th- that's part of the theology of um, of, the, of the bhagavad gita and and hinduism so like the sun is that part of the nature like mother nature taking you towards y- the moksha all of that is towards moksha but in vedanta neither both of those are signs that we have not attained enlightenment because those who attain enlightenment don't go through this path or that path they don't go at all as i mentioned the body dissolves here back into nature and the subtle being also the subtle body also dissolves back into nature you remain as brahman that's freedom and that's what we are uh, we are trying right now to dissolve the dream once for all to see through to cut through the de- dream um otherwise what happens is uh, it you're replacing the dark path and the light path you're replacing a uh, not so good dream with a nice dream because there are still both dreams as the mother said <laughs> it's nothing but a dream but you have to wake up from the dream yes in the last question that was asked the lady asks that she's not good at meditation or that's not for her something that she can pursue is there a chance that she can still get to be you know in a spiritual advancement sure of course why not even if but, but my point was even if i'm not good at meditation it's not a problem of meditation it's just that my mental makeup is not very suited to that practice any master would tell you that um, please continue with the practices you may not put so much stress on it but whatever you have committed to if you are initiated into a practice at least that much even if it's mechanical after all, it's not bad it's it's good and every little bit helps thank you okay we'll end with that um namaste ji i have a question as a grahastha so uh, 
you know, my first question is regarding the life partner question that was there. Like, if you have uh, somebody opened a can of worms. <laughs> So, like, what if you have a life partner, like, who does not same spiritual path as you and keeps pulling you back? That's first. The second is, as a grahastha, is it okay, like, for your path to kind of go between the karma, the karma yoga and the, you know, when you're doing the karma, you are in that mode, but when you're doing the puja, you are in the bhakti yoga, and yes, you're in the yes. The, is that okay or you need to right right back, so two yeah. good questions the first one is if you have a life partner who is not interested in spirituality I see this quite often it's often a struggle and either somebody you know the, your spouse doesn't give you the freedom or the opportunity or the encouragement to go down that path of spiritual practice yourself and this leads to friction or the other way around, you are an enthusiast and your spouse is not interested, but you want to drag that person <laughs> into spiritual, you know, it's good for you. I'm telling you to do, do this. In either case, it's, it's a struggle. It's not good. I'm not going to give you marriage counseling there. <laughs> I'm really not the person for it. But it does not mean that there isn't a lot of wisdom in Vedanta for this kind of, uh, for practical questions of day-to-day -day life. Vedanta has uh, wonderful insights into what the problem is and how we can handle it and navigate it to become spiritual. Uh, I don't know if this is the right time to mention it. There's one Vedanta teacher, she's a lady in India. Her name is Janki Ji. Uh, I came across, I haven't met her, but I came across her teachings online. I'm planning to invite her for an online talk. She's really good when, you know, when people ask her all sorts of questions like this related to day-to-day, -day, the minutiae of family life, career, people in the community, a lot of um, internal problems. And she brings to bear all these teachings, especially from the Bhagavad Gita, onto this and gives really good uh, advice on that. So yes, that's true. Uh, one can use Vedanta and should use to solve this problem. I don't know what exactly you can do in your own case. Um, um, as adults, I think one can come to a kind of understanding that uh, there are certain things that I would like to do in your life and in my life, and I don't want to drag into you into it if you're not interested. But at the same time, I would want my independence and time and energy to do it. Uh, the um, second thing is karma, bhakti, uh, yoga, the meditation. It's a very good question. Aren't there different attitudes when I'm serving somebody? Clearly, I'm this person with this body, mind. I'm serving somebody. So I'm doing selfless karma yoga in the ashram or in the community or something. Then when I sit down and worship the deity in my puja room, uh, I have a different attitude. When I'm doing this, uh, deconstructing the self and trying to understand I'm the witness consciousness, it's a different attitude. So can we have different attitudes? You can, but both are possible. One is, when you do devotion, do it like a dualist. God is real. I am this small sentient being and I am doing with all love and surrender and feeling the presence of God. None of that I am Brahman stuff there. Keep that out of the door. <laughs> when you're doing the karma yoga, uh, you do it uh, uh, selflessly. It is good. People's suffering is being removed. This is my offering to my Lord in this way. When in meditation, forget the world, all responsibilities in the world, forget everything. I and my Lord in this stillness, in the way you have been taught by your Guru. It could be God, it could be non-theistic meditation like mindfulness, whatever. And when you do Jnana Yoga, it's I'm investigating into myself. This is one way. And we often do that in our order also, we do that. Another way is to organize the whole thing under one paradigm. I am a Jnana Yogi. So when I'm doing Jnana Yoga, that's my core practice. When I'm doing um, Karma Yoga, that also. I'm working on the selfishness in this particular mind. I'm the pure Atman. But this, I'm cleansing the mind through Karma Yoga. I'm settling the mind on the witness consciousness through meditation. Through devotion, I'm reducing my ego. I'm surrendering to the Lord who is in charge of the movie. Yeah. Yes. Whatever happens in this life, whether you're a jnani, bhakta, whatever it is, the Lord is in charge. So that, acknowledging that. But the whole framework is I am a jnani. 
So you can do that. As a bhakta, as a devotee, you can be a karma yogi, bhakti yogi, um, dhyana, jnana, all of them can happen as a devotee. As a jnani also you can have it. So all of these, so there are two, two paradigms possible. One is, each one you do with that appropriate mental attitude. That's also all right. So far, Swami Premeshanji in one place says, when let us be um, the most staunch of dualists, Dvaitavadi, when we are worshipping the deity in the temple, when we are worshipping the suffering beings, Jiva Gyane, Shiva Jnana Jiva Seva, worship of all sentient beings as Shiva, uh, Shivaratri is coming, let us be Vishishta Dvaitins, the whole world is pervaded by one Brahman. And when we sit in deep meditation, the world becomes an appearance to us. I am this limitless existence consciousness. Please let us be Advaitins. So <laughs> he's putting it that way. Advaitins in deep meditation, Vishishta Advaitins in service, and Dvaitins in, in your personal worship at home or in the shrine. I mean, it's sort of rhetorical. But this also is possible. Any one of them. Thank you so much.